and uh, so I will introduce uh, Professor Vlad. And um, uh, so he's a professor of uh, Hindu studies and comparative religion at Oxford University, and also an academic director at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Uh, Professor Flood's research interests are in medieval Hindu texts, especially from the traditions of Shiva. And his other interests are in comparative religion and phenomenology. Professor Flood published uh, many books. His publications, his book, his book publications include such books as um, uh, Religion and the Philosophy of Life, published in uh, 2019, uh, the Truth Within, A History of Inwardness in Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism, published in 2013. The Importance of Religion, Meaning and Action in Our Strange World, published in 2012. And uh, also a celebrated book, uh, An Introduction to Hinduism. And of course, besides many, many publications, he's also the general editor of the series, The Oxford History of Hinduism. So, uh, Professor Platt, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Ian, for organizing this wonderful conference. I'm sorry I wasn't able to come yesterday, but I was just too busy with um, other meetings and things and so on. Um, well, I, I, last night I prepared, I had, I had some weeks ago, I prepared a lecture on the comparative uh, religion in relation to this question of translation. And then last night I suddenly thought, oh, I, sh I, can't, I, sh I don't want to do that. I want to do something more specific. So I redid my, I rewrote my talk entirely, which I think will be probably more interesting with a concrete example. So um, I'm going to share um, a screen with you. I'll show you some slides. Um, so if I click share screen, Ah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I suppose I just uh, uh, you, you should you now should you should be able to share. Uh, oh, there we are. So can you see that, everyone? Yes, everything is visible. Good, good. Okay, if I click on that, that should do it. Oh yeah, comparative method in Hinduism. So we have um. I have 20 minutes and then we've got about 10 minutes for discussion. So I want to begin by looking at different models of comparison. There's different understandings of comparison imply different understandings of translation. So there was uh, the original lecture I was going to give was about um, uh, the, the problems, problems in comparative religion uh, based on um, the problem of Neo-Kantianism in um, Gillian Rose, who was a, a philosopher who wrote some interesting work. She wrote a book called uh, Hegel Contra Sociology. And in that she argued that sociology was fundamentally Neo-Kantian, which she saw as problematic. Now I was going to look at the same sort of thing in relation to comparative religion, uh, because the Husserlian model, if you like, of the philosopher Husserl, which implies a subject quite distinct from an object, if you like. And that, that model of comparison, which I haven't got time to go into here, implies a platonic understanding of the text. So we have this in the notion of, um, you know, you produce a critical edition of a text and you, and you note the witnesses, the witnesses to the text. So that implies a kind of the ADOS, the pure kind of text of which there are different witnesses. Um, and so that's, a model of translation, which is based, which is also linked to a certain model of comparative religion or even um, comparative study more generally. Now, I, I think I'd like to generally contrast that or even oppose that view with a kind of hermeneutical phenomenological view, which implies a more historically contingent model of the text rather than the platonic kind of eidos, eidos which is reflected in the witnesses. So that's a sort of general theoretical uh, background. Now, I thought it'd be more interesting rather than me going on about that, would be more interesting for you to hear a concrete example uh, from the Shakta Shaiva traditions of Hinduism, the, the religions of Shiva and the religions of, of the goddess. 
which fused together in the post-Gupta period about after, after 600 AD uh, and that developed particularly in Kashmir. So that's what I'm going to be speaking about uh, today and raise the issues that I began with uh, at the end. Um, now there are textual accounts of what might be called meditation and its accompanying doctrines of liberation, which I thought you might be of interest to this particular uh, conference. Uh, now these were expanded in this Shaiva Shakta scriptures, these scriptures which were Shaiva but strongly influenced by goddess traditions. And these texts that came to be known as tantras in the early medieval period. Now these traditions were very much concerned with rituals. So you, the Shaiva Siddhanta, which is the, the standard tantric Shaiva uh, um, religion, uh, system in the religion of Shiva, whereby you get liberated through initiation by the guru and you undergo a process of ritual through your life to purify your soul so that uh, at death you're liberated, videha mukti, at death you, you attain e equality with Shiva, Shiva Tulya. You don't merge with Shiva, you become like Shiva. Um, now that became the standard pattern in, in medieval, early medieval Hinduism of ritual. And this system became very widely adopted by kings throughout South Asia and Southeast Asia. Now there was, a, in response to that, there was another tradition that developed that says, no, you're not, it's not that you're, you remain distinct in liberation, you are Shiva, you become one with Shiva. So these non, non-Siddhanta traditions developed, which were very much focused on the goddess. So some of these texts focus on the goddess and indeed upon um, the ferocious form of Shiva were concerned with meditation or contemplation, were concerned with bhavana or dhyana, visualization in particular, because they thought you could get liberated, you get saved through this practice of meditation and liberation. So it wasn't enough just to perform your ritual duties and then when you die, having done that, you gain equality with Shiva. You can attain liberation in this life, Jivan Mukti, uh, through this process of meditation. Uh, one text of Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, you have these various meditations there, but without visualization. So there are, well, on the one hand, there are systems of visualization. You visualize the deity, you imagine yourself as the God. In the other, there are kinds of meditation where you don't do that. You imagine like an empty space or you stare into a pot and look at the empty space in the pot or stare up into the sky and see the empty space in the sky and meditate on that. So um, you get this idea within these traditions, the goddess traditions of, meditation as an expanded awareness. And there's one religion that I want to look at now within this goddess religion called the Krama. The Krama means gradation because it offered a system of meditation on gradations of, of, um, of the goddess, of her emanations and contractions. And then there are two philosophers called Abhinavagupta and his uh, student and also nephew, Kshema Raja, in the early in the late 10th, early um, 11th century in Kashmir, who wrote about this. So I hope it's not too confusing so far what I've been saying. You're on the one, you've got mainstream tantric religion of Shaiva Siddhanta, you've got an alternative religion based on a different revelation, which challenges that, says ritual isn't enough, you have to have meditation to get liberation in this life. And those texts are very much focused on the goddess. Now this tradition, this, the Krama, talks about expanded consciousness as non-dual awareness. And the highest state here is um, the sky of consciousness. And it has its own scriptural revelation. And there are two texts in particular, the Kali Kula Panchashataka, the hundred, uh, 500 verses on the, on the family of the goddess Kali, uh, and the Kali Kula Krama Sadbhava, the, the essence of the, of the uh, tradition of, 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 of Kali, if you like. Now, here's an example, number one. I've got a couple of examples I'll give you, textual examples. 
Um, I will tell you, this is the goddess speaking, who she's talking to, she's talking to Shiva. I will tell you about the secret supreme system relating to the goddess. One should meditate the supreme sun, whose nature is light, the supreme expansive one, the circle of pure consciousness connected to limited consciousness, I'll talk about that in a minute, having the appearance of 10 million moons. So that's what the text says, that's the Sanskrit. We, have, we probably won't have time to go into it, but we got it there if we, if we need to in the discussion. It goes on, he who suddenly finds that the, uh, he who suddenly finds that, so I'll put the bracket in the wrong place, that what does that refer to? That refers to this level of tranquilized consciousness identified with the goddess. He who realizes that expanded awareness becomes a mover in the sky of consciousness. Um, Kechara, a mover, a chara, one who, a charin, one who moves in the Kechara, in the, in the K, sorry, in the sky, in the sky of consciousness, the Chid Gagana. So the entire immeasurable universe is consumed again by the play of the goddess, it then says. So it's a bit mixed up this text, but it, it assumes that the universe is a manifestation of the goddess who then consumes the universe as well. She emanates it and kind of gobbles it up, eats it up again as well. And this cycle of emanation and contraction is related to um, the emanation and contraction of consciousness, which in our meditation we can understand and realize. And the text goes on, there is no one equal on earth to that practitioner or sadhaka who, who does that practice, he stands supreme in the three worlds, in his power, like the Lord. The supreme power of consciousness has been told to you, O three-eyed one, that's Shiva. This is the supreme secret which cannot be named, which is Anarkya, cannot be named, the system of the goddess. So there's the, the Sanskrit text there. So that's example number one. We've only got five minutes, so example number two, the, the moon in the sky of consciousness, uh, which is a text composed between 1100 and 1300 AD, begins by extolling the expanse of consciousness. Quote, the sky of consciousness, Chid Vyoma here, rather than Chid Gagana, Chid Vyoma, is like an ocean of milk, like the full moon, a glittering wave, an expansive sound, a garland of undulating waves with drops of shimmering and spreading light. This sky of consciousness is the essence of the primal vibration that spreads out as a syllable OM. So again, a very expansive vibrational understanding of the universe as consciousness and as sound, as, as um, sound OM, and as the Sanskrit text. Now, it, it, the text says this, diff this system is difficult to understand, durvignayam, it's difficult to approach, is conducive to enlightenment of the perfected ones, of the Siddhas, and it's the essence, the Paramamsaram, that cannot be told, it's beyond words, akatam, it can't be spoken about, it can't be told, it's anarchia, it's the, um, it, it, it's um, nameless. And having abandoned, it's, it's beyond the distinction between speech and its objects, the Varcha, the objects, and the, the, the Varchaka, the speech, and it's, it's, it's abandoned, it's Varajitam, it's left behind that distinction between subject and object. And it's not an entity, it's not an object, Bhavyam, this sky of consciousness is not an object. It's, it's, um, so it's a kind of critique of um, ontotheology in a way, so it's not an object. And yet it is consciousness, and it's Sambiti here. So the text uses the feminine noun Sanviti because it's referring to the goddess. Um, now, this also, this text also refers to a system of 13 Kalis. It describes the emanation and contraction of the universe, which we just referred to in that text, as emanations and contractions of 13 forms of Kali, the ferocious goddess Kali. Now, Abhi Navagupta, in his work, talks about the internalization of that. That's, that's a kind of external expansion and contraction model, but he says that also happens within consciousness. And there's an identification of consciousness with cosmological process. So the cosmology is identified with the psychology. We haven't got time to go into all of this, um, but what I want to uh, focus on, that's an, those two examples I've given, textual examples, then raises interesting questions about how we translate, what, what translation is in this context. 
So there are various terms I've translated by the English word consciousness, and they're varied. So the textual material presented above, we've got a number of words that I've, I've used the same English word to translate all of them. Chit, chitti, chetana, samgya, sanviti, sanvit, and vijnana. All these are different Sanskrit terms, which I've translated by the English word consciousness. There's also the term manas, mind, that is used. So we've got to be, inter it's interesting, we've got to be careful here. So chit, samvit, vijnana are used synonymously, it seems to me, in those texts. If you look at the use of those words, they're used interchangeably, it seems to me, to refer to the supreme reality, its absolute power, identified in theistic language as Shiva or the goddess. So you've got a theistic language of Shiva or the goddess, but you've also got this impersonal language of consciousness used in these texts. And I'm raising the question, the problem of how we translate these terms. Now, chit is a masculine noun that refers to the pure consciousness of Shiva, whereas chiti is a feminine noun referring to the pure consciousness identified with the goddess, as in those two examples that I've given you from the text. Chaitana, on the other hand, refers to the individual or particular embodied consciousness. And we find this in Shemaraja's Pratyabhigna Hridaya, the essence of the recognition of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of um, the individual consciousness with absolute consciousness. And there, Chaitana is chitti, particularized or contracted in the individual. So there he says, chitti sankochana, some Kochatma Chaitan Chaitan or Chaitana, the Chaitana, the um, individual consciousness, has the nature, the Atma of some culture of contracted absolute consciousness. So again, a philosophical articulation of that same idea. Now we see the identification of the elevated or expanded consciousness with light, prakasha, and sky, gagana, vyoma, ka. So these words, chitti, chit, chaitanya, sambit, vijnana, are identified with prakasha, light, are identified with the sky, the sky of consciousness. And the three words are used, vyoma, ka, and gaganam, which is our truest and our deepest nature, svabhava. So it links this kind of almost metaphorical external metaphor with your essence, the essence of the person, the svabhava. Uh, and we become open to this sky. And the idea of openness is used figuratively. So this text often uses the, the word um, drimbanam or vijrimbanam, which means, you know, like uh, yawning, it means openness generally. But here it's, it's used figuratively to mean a kind of openness to the sky of consciousness. And we might even use the word openness, translate the word openness to mean um, freedom, perhaps, anyway. So the verticality of the sky of consciousness intersects with the horizontality of con the constrained world in which we live most of the time as a spontaneous freedom. So this word openness implies a spontaneous freedom. We become open to the sky of consciousness through this meditation process. So here I've tried to represent it diagrammatically, the unnameable the anarchia, which is a pure apophasis, that which cannot be spoken about, is articulated or expressed as the expanded sky of consciousness and as light, as Chidgagana and Prakasha. And then we relate to that, the text and the, and the practice are, there's a practice of the text, if you like, if you like uh, which is meditation and certain ritual practices, which open us to this expanded sky of consciousness now all this text practice in inter interconnectivity is within a certain socio-cultural comportment towards the world and the law, the dharma, as the underlying foundation of the practice. So it's an interesting question. This seems to be fairly disruptive of the constrictive socio-political um, world in which it was composed, and indeed it is. Uh, but Abhinav, someone like Abhinavagupta would maintain that, yes, you have to maintain your, your dharma, your, your conformity to social norms and obligations while, while practicing this kind of practice in your inner life. So that's interesting in, in itself. So what I'm trying to draw attention to is um, that you have this problem of translation and the way in which um, uh, 
you know, these, these terms, uh, it's difficult to translate. Now, I would want to advocate, therefore, coming back to the problematic that I opened with, uh, how are we to understand this kind of textual material? And rather than the kind of um, the, the Rose critique of the neo-Kantianism of the Husserlian model, if you like, I would like to say that philology is a first level. I'd like to, I would like to advocate a hermeneutical phenomenology of which philology is a first level. Now, philology has come under severe critique in recent years as being on the, on part of a, a, a colonial enterprise and the oppression of the other. Uh, I would completely reject that because on the contrary, philology is, um, allows what shows itself to be seen. It gives voice to the other through the text, through the philological method, we can um, allow the voice of the other to be heard through the text, whether that's in the contemporary world or in the ancient past. Um, that I've got lots of examples of that, but we haven't got time for that. Now, a second level though, beyond, phenomena, beyond philology, uh, inquires level requires uh, inquires into meaning and truth um, and the specification of the constraint what are constraints that con that are controlling this text into its particularity why it says what it's saying and a third level I think is comparative because of the density of the textual data raises questions of comparison across traditions so thank you that's the end Uh, thank you so much, Professor Flood. Uh, you have uh, touched a lot of aspects and your presentation was very rich. So, and now uh, let's move to uh, Q&A part and I invite uh, the audience to raise questions or to comment. So please. I have a question. Uh, please, please speak out. More about this notion of philology as phenomenology. <laughs> yes. Hello. <laughs> I've never heard that use of um, phenomenology because phenomenology in the Husserlian sense is the reduction of things to the eidetic essences. How would philology do that? Um, no, I don't want to do that. As I was arguing uh, against, I was, I was think, uh, I was advocate. I would advocate a hermeneutical phenomenology, which isn't a Husserlian model but more based on the kind of, that begins with the being in the world, if you like. Now, um, yeah, philology is, uh, in my view, is, is um, it can be used. Um, so hermeneutic phenomenology is Heidegger's innovation on Husserl. Yeah, that's right. That's what I would, yeah, that's right. That I, begins, I would, that's what I want to begin. That begins with our being in the world. Yeah. And um, Heidegger's great discovery is that Husserl neglected, well, later on Husserl picks up with Lebenswelt, but Heidegger's critique is that you are starting from Cartesian beginnings, which Husserl was completely aware of. He was a great defender of Descartes, saw himself in that tradition, but Heidegger's critique is that you've neglected the factical Dasein, the way we actually live in the world and navigate it. So That's right. I'm just curious how are you saying that there's a layer to texts that have to do with our irreducible embodiment and our being in the world, and that's what philology uncovers, and then it follows the same process as Heidegger's hermeneutic phenomenology? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I think that there's, perhaps there's a disconnect there, but I think that we have to, we've just been, we, we just done two years on uh, Heidegger, uh, actually, being in time we've been reading, and um, problems of phenomenology, but I think I was, I'm so pleased to hear what you just said about the discovery. I think Heidegger is absolute, I think he has, he's discovered something new. And uh, I'm, you know, it's very nice to hear you say about the, about, you know, use that word discovery. Now, um, I think you're, what you, the latter thing that you just said is correct, that philology is a method uh, in which we allow what shows itself to be seen, but we need, uh, something more than that, we need, uh, in my view, we need a hermeneutical phenomenology, which it, for me begins with a kind of Heideggerian being in the world, mm -hmm. in which we can understand the deeper uh, connectivity of, the, of that of which the text is referring. Mm -hmm. um, we have to assume that, if you like, and that's our start, that's our um, beyond, deeper than philology, we have to assume a kind of second level phenomenology, which is hermeneutical, mm -hmm. which um, 
attempts to link, attempts to understand the text. Now Heidegger spoke about um, what he called, um, or what was that term? Um, the link between, I mean, in his religious, phenomenology of the religious life, uh, you can understand the, the Augustine or Paul because you can recognize their humanity. You can recognize the humanity in me as a link to the humanity in those past authors. So I, likewise, the humanity in us, which is identified or revealed or exposed through a hermeneutical phenomenology is a link to the humanity which is exposed or developed in the text. When we get at the humanity developed or exposed in the other other text through the through philological method. I'm sympathetic to your approach, but I'm not sure that example works because Heidegger is able to access Paul um, because he's reading Luther. Yeah, he's able to read Luther because he is Christian of a certain kind, which is his break with the as he writes to Father Engelbert Krebs. He can no longer accept the worldview of Catholicism. Yeah. If he had remained within that worldview, he would not have been able to access Paul at this radical level. So I think there's a, there's, I mean, the, the leveling of different Lebensauslegung to one common Lebensauslegung, which Heidegger does at some point and says, it's, we're all Pauline, whether we recognize it or not, Paul touched upon the essence of the human condition. Yeah. And then he, of course, only read people who supported that reading, such as Kierkegaard. That's very problematic. He ended up dismissing the entire Catholic tradition and saying this is not truly philosophy, uh, sorry, not truly uh, theology. It's, it's just Greek ontology. He ends up dismissing Catholicism, breaks with it. He ends up dismissing Greek thought as sort of something to be overcome and the first beginning of thought, but we're at the end of that metaphysical journey and so on. And Using that as a model, Heidegger would never read the ancients and he would never read the Indians. He, in fact, thought yeah. in Indians didn't have philosophy. Yeah, that's right. He thought that. Yeah. There's some pretty horrific references to the Asiatic hordes in one of his texts, which I can yeah. look up for you. So, yeah, I think that's, that's right. But we, we, um, we, we shouldn't sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and thinking and that what in, in the Heidegger's, like the notion of the formal indication, the formala and Zeiger, whatever it is. Mm. Now that is a is quite interesting because it it um, it's a kind of a recognition of the of the of the of the of a shared hum, humanity in my view. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go into Heidegger's politics and stuff, but um, we don't have to uh, stick with what Heidegger says, but we can we can use his insights and his understanding to develop new thoughts mm. that are relevant to us today. Um, well, and one of those. Yeah, let's let's continue this elsewhere because I just finished translating his Habilitation Schrift. Oh, have you? Oh, wow! Yeah. So great. Um, it'll be interesting to continue this another time. I would love to talk with you about it. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>